So my name's Justin Witte. I'm the director of the Cleve Carney Art Gallery. Um, and it is uh, my pleasure to welcome you to our fourth lecture in the 2016-17 Visiting Artist Series. Uh, the Visiting Artist Series is a partnership between the gallery, the Fine Arts Department, with support from the COD Foundation. <coughs> Today we are very fortunate to have Petra Bachmeier from Luftwerk. Luftwerk is the artistic collaboration of Petra Bachmeier and Sean Galero. Uh, Sean is not here today because he is prepping for a large installation at the Denver Art Museum that Petra will be running to shortly after this as well. Petra and Sean describe their work this way. Luftwerk creates art installation using light, color, and material to augment experiences of space and sight, blending history and contemporary media to open new aesthetic conversations. Luftwerk has created these installations in locations such as Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Waterhouse in Pennsylvania, Cloudgate in Millennium Park, and on the 606 Trail in Chicago. They have created site-specific installations across the globe and have worked in the worlds of architecture, theater, and fine art. In 2013, while visiting their exhibition Shift at the Chicago Cultural Center, I entered the galleries and was greeted by a large installation of subtly shifting colored squares. As I watched the squares slowly shift in hue and intensity, I became aware of the quiet noises of the space, the reflected light on the walls and the ceiling, of other visitors' footsteps, and of my own breathing. The piece had the effect of centering me in the moment. It was a feeling akin to that of working in the studio, sitting in nature, or even meditation. So, with the end of an extremely stressful and divisive election coming tomorrow, I can think of no better way to spend this hour than listening to Petra about the work of Luftwerk. So I'm pleased to welcome Petra Bachmann. Thank you for having me here, Justin and Mara. I'm very excited to talk to you today. And I'm also looking forward to spending more time here next year as we are actually working or opening an exhibition here at the DuPage Art Center in the Cleve Carney Cleve Carney <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the work we are preparing for the gallery is what I would call shift point two and the focus of my conversation with you today is about shift and color and space so I'm gonna take you right into the work that Justin beautifully described and predominantly Luftwerk works with color, light, and space. And we've researched color theory quite extensively. And when looking at color theory, since I'm actually originally from Germany, I connected very well with Johann Wolfgang von Goethe's color theory. It's very extensive. Goethe is predominantly known for his poetry, but he actually was a really inquisitive mind who was also very scientific and how he kind of studied the surrounding and how we perceive color. And what I really like about Goethe's theory is about how he connects color to emotion. So it's not just a perceptive thing, it's also how it affects you in your being. So he kind of connects the red and the, and the orange hues to beauty and the noble, noble character. Uh, yellow is more of like um, the mind, greens to the natural feeling, and so forth. Like there's always a sentiment that goes with the color. And I'm gonna play a video now. Please apologize the very sleepy music that comes with it and enjoy what it is saying. However well we get to know the world, it will always contain a day and a night side. Yellow and orange hues bear the essence of light, Goethe says. An immediate warmth seems to billow towards us. Blue and violet hues, however, 
bear the essence of darkness. Like the high blue sky and the distant blue mountains, a blue surface seems to recede from us. When we look at the world, we see colors. We are used to thinking that these colors have something to do with the light. All cats look the same in the dark, we say. If the light disappears, the colors disappear. But if the darkness disappears, the colors disappear too. It's the light and the darkness together that create colors and render the world recognizable. In physics, colors can be measured, but colors possess other qualities and properties which cannot be measured, but which we sense immediately. When the sun rises in the east, we may have the good fortune to observe a very special phenomenon. For a moment, the orange-red light of the sun plays directly upon the cliff, and our shadows appear to be greenish-blue. These shadows are actually grey. Our eyes form the greenish-blue as a counter to the powerful orangish-red light. This simpler setup helps to show what really happens. We illuminate a cone, from the left at first with white light, then from the right with white light. There is now a grey shadow on each side of the cone. If we add a green filter to the left-hand lamp, the whole setup is bathed in green light, except for the part that is in the shade of the cone. This time, when we switch on the light on the right, which is still white, our vision creates a magenta shade where there is room for it, namely in the grey shadow. If we zoom in until we can't see the surroundings anymore, but only the shadow itself, it stops looking magenta and turns grey again. If we view the shadow in isolation, it is grey, but when we see it in the context of which it is part, our vision invokes a magenta shade. Magenta is green's complementary colour. This is the basic inspiration that has been driving shift. Um, I'm really fond of the idea of colour lives between light and dark. And also, how do we perceive color? How does contrast of color affect of how we perceive it? So if you look at these, at this color chart now, it's the identical colors in a different background. But you will, through the contrast, one co they don't look alike. So it's really kind of our subjective experience of how we see color. I'm also really fond of Johannes Itten. It's probably like, the one color theorist that every painter is going to work off. It's based on the primary, secondary, and tertiary color mixing. And it's a really kind of like the basic of color mixing, like how do we mix color, what are the results. And what we did was take this Itten's color wheel and made it into a digital file. So within Photoshop, we just took the color wheel and kind of created a mosaic effect and got all these views out of it. And the goal was, let's just paint all of these colors and see how the different shades kind of come out. So we actually really painted 526 tiles of color with a different hue, following this map. Like, this was our guideline. And then we hung all of these color tiles, which all together summoned into a, a wall that was 20 feet by 20 feet. Just like that. But of course it was our subjective interpretation of the color wheel. And we then projected light onto it. So for us the interest was like, 
or the interest is the interaction of color and light, like what happens between the two. We were doing an exercise at home, like we had like both yoga mats, like two yoga mats rolled out. One was orange, one was blue. And since we work with light, of course we have color changing light where we live. And we saw, oh my God, with the color changing light, the, the colors of these yoga mats are popping. And they became like this animated surface of like, wow, what's happening between color and light and the interaction of it? It's so fascinating. Like when you imagine like you have a red color and you project red light on it, it becomes really vibrant red versus like if you take the shades off the red color lighting, like you are muting the color of the actual material color. So it's the interaction of color and light that really kind of informs shift and it's actually also informing the exhibition we are preparing for the gallery here. And really what you saw in, the, in this short documentary about Goethe and color theory gave us the inspiration to what if we just create a space where you have that experiment of color and shadow as an experiential immersive installation. So using white floor, three color lights, and they would cycle through the three colors like red, blue, and green, like just like on the cycle of it. And in the middle, in the center where they meet, they create white light. But once you step in, you reveal the color shift. This piece is called Synesis. It also worked with a sound piece in relation to this color perceptive shadow play. And for us, it was really unexpected. It became a very successful public interactive piece. People started to really immerse themselves, created like their own shadow figures. They made their own dance videos on this white floor. And it was really kind of, sometimes you surprise yourself with like, oh, a simple thought leads to other people adding to that and actually engaging with the work in a way that we did not anticipate. Another piece within Shift is titled Threshold. If you look through the two walls in the center, you are peeking into an obelisk made of mirror at a 90 degree angle. And next to the obelisk, we projected video. Um, and what happens with reflection and light is really like you can bend light through reflective surfaces like mirror or glass. And using the 90 degree angle, it allowed us that the light that was projected on the wall would bend and create this illusion as if there's a portal. Like the idea was to expand or create an illusion of expanding space so that like from afar, when you, once you enter the Chicago Cultural Center, you could see far into the depth. This piece that I just described with the mirror and the light bending and glass was really inspired. Like a lot of our projects are site specific and use video and video mapping on architecture. And we did one video architecture mapping piece for Farnsworth House in 2014. And that was kind of like a, a very eye-opening experience for us. It was really for our own curiosity what happens with light projecting on a glass house. When we researched prior to actually going to the house, every everything we found about projecting light on glass would say there is nothing you can project on, you have no surface. So here we are, we wanted to project on the Farnsworth house and we came with a projector, we put it in front of the house and it did magic for us. Like, so it was kind of, this is exactly what we are looking for, that you're actually projecting through the glass and to create this volume. Like our projection would flood the ceiling <coughs> And then once you're actually inside of the house, the house expanded, like just through this inner play of light and glass and reflectivity. And it was really fascinating for us to see this difference. Like here you see like, okay, we are video mapping the outline of the structure. There is not much to project on. It's really slim horizontal slabs with vertical, very slim beams, but through the light traveling through the space, it, once you entered, it became like a floating place. And this kind of intervention, or like learning from the Farnsworth House, actually influenced 
our exhibition at the Cultural Center that Justin described. So kind of we are still working currently in the studio with similar concepts of like bending light, using mirrors, and working a lot with color and interaction with light. And most of our work is really context specific or site specific. And so it was a project that we just closed in September, like at the end of, the sept of this September. And it was a project that was up for one year at the Garfield Park Conservatory. And the exhibition was titled Solarize, a sea of all colors. This was actually a project that was two years in the making. And you know things like this, they don't come too quickly. There's a lot of legwork and a lot of research on our end involved. Like we wanted to make um, an exhibition that is connected to the site and not just plopped into the place. We really looked into like who built the conservatory and it was Chance Jensen. And why is the conservatory in Chicago so long? And all of these facts were of real interest to how we engage with this architectural landmark, but also with the collection, which is predominantly a beautiful plant collection. And with the, this piece titled Beacon, we installed LED lights, like along the vertical ribs of the architecture. And these ribs, for us, they mimicked we, we kind of interpreted them as, as prairie grass. The structure is mimicking a haystack because it's the Midwest. So we took these vertical ribs in our way as, okay, this is prairie grass and it's gonna blow in the wind. So we used for this one year duration of the exhibit, we used wind speed to inform how fast the lights are moving. Currently, we are actually, this piece is gonna stay as on every evening at the conservatory. We are using video imagery filmed in the garden, in the back in the city garden, where they have trees that were actually planted by the architect and designer by Chance Jensen himself, and how those leaves, like his trees and the leaves are blowing in the wind. So we took it off the internet and gave it like video imagery, representational imagery, but through the spacing of this matrix, it's fairly abstract. And one other thought that we kind of really rumored about was uh, framing nature. Jens Jensen, anybody who is ever gonna dive deeper into kind of Chicago and its history, you will find Jens Jensen. It's kind of really the person who made the parks the way they are. I learned a lot. I learned to appreciate Chicago a lot more through looking at his ideas. And the idea of framing nature stuck with me. And this piece is very literal in a sense. It's framing the waterfall. The conservatory has a really tiny waterfall in the very far end. And it's trickling in, in inspiration of the Spring Song Sonata, which I thought, what a beautiful reference you can make like with how you build things and you reference it to a piece of music or you know that it's not just like stone slabs put on top of each other to make a, an artificial waterfall but you're actually taking music to mimic the sound of the of like you're putting stones so they mimic the sound of music and we wanted to highlight this legend of the conservatory with their beautiful waterfall story so we were framing the waterfall but also having in mind framing the experience of nature while reflecting its surrounding. And this piece is titled Fluorescence. And it is red and blue because our question was, okay, I know what I see, but what do I know about how plants see? So what do plants see? They only perceive in the color spectrum between red and blue. So they need blue for directionality, and they need red for flowering processes. So that's why you see in greenhouses, you see a lot of like artificial grow houses, you see this pink light emitting, that's always an interplay between red and blue. And so I was really fascinated, like out of the whole spectrum 
of color, plants only, abs only absorb red and blue and they emit uh, greens and yellows. So this kind of like brought us into like two colors to work with for a place that's titled Show House, where the conservatory has rotating flower exhibits. And we wanted to kind of create a very kind of playful, immersive experience that is also for people feeling red and blue about it. And kind of observe over time, like, does it affect plant life? I think we didn't really get to that point. <laughs> so, but we thought, like, uh, it was washing the show house on a sunny day very beautifully. And at night, we actually, like here you see actually the red and blue shadows. For us, this was actually a huge shift in our practice to think of like, let's create a light piece, not using uh, electrical light. Let's create a light piece where the sun is our collaborator. But of course, we also illuminated this piece in the nighttime. And that's where it also got really interesting for us because the conservatory, the horticulture staff collaborated really closely with Sean and myself in their plant collection. So you see like how in the center of the room there are these flower beds and they're all chosen on how they interact with color changing light. So we were in heaven when this happened. Uh, this came about uh, one year, like the summer that we are installing this exhibition. Uh, Sean and I came to the conservatory with a color changing LED light and showed the horticultural director, look what happens, look what happens if you have color like flowers and we shine color changing light on it. And he got so fascinated by it that for the entire duration of this exhibition, Solarize, he would curate how plants react to color changing light. And I thought that was kind of like a real treat where you see as an artist, like, oh, what happens if you collaborate with people that you would not normally collaborate with? They really kind of become partners and are equal caretakers of your work. One more piece that I talk about Solarize here is called Seed of Light. It is using a circular pattern inspired by the flower of life. It's a symbol of creation, an uh, ancient symbol. And we wanted to create a, using the symbol, its geometry into a more kind of interactive light installation using water drops. So what you see are like trays of water. And above each tray is a light fixture with a water drop release, a solenoid valve. And we program these valves to release droplets and to cast shadows on the floor. So this piece was mostly active in night times. And it really kind of, in a way, our work always wants to be immersive. Our work, we want you to kind of engage with the work, like with the space that you're in it, and also kind of like perceive it as an entire environment. So we have been informing ourselves a lot through like the natural surrounding, how kind of like color, nature and so forth influence what we do and inspire. And we also look at data in nature. And what you're looking at right now is E. coli. It's the comparing to E. coli levels of the Chicago River and the river in Hamburg. What do you think of Chicago is? <laughs> <laughs> And so we've become very interested in like, uh, how do we use numbers and visualize these numbers and actually create an environment based on this. So we created an installation titled Flow in, in an alley in Chicago. And it is actually a beautiful story of this alley. The alley is the first permeable pavement alley that Chicago ever had. It's a green alley. So the water that we are releasing from water mist screens is actually getting absorbed and so it was kind of a beautiful relationship to what we wanted to talk about the Chicago waterway the river and how our art piece can it was a really good connection between site and content I think the majority of audi our audience did not really care so. <laughs>
Uh, but for us, it was important uh, to partner up with NRDC, Natural Resource Defense Council. They helped us understand the data of the Chicago River and how what it means. So for us, it was really kind of neat to kind of connect with an environmental agency and have them be like have them support us and also how do we inform the public. So they gave out leaflets to pedestrians to say like, hey, this is, these are five ways of how you can make your water cleaner, our, how to preserve our water. And last but not least, we're currently, based on this data relation, like researching data, we are actually working on two other data projects right now. We're working on one project that is going to be public the projected opening date is December 11th at the 606. It's a commission by Trust for Public Land and the goal is to illuminate the Milwaukee Avenue Bridge and that data will be driven by weather. Like we are really in the studio now working on how do we use weather data and we are probably using like representational video content, like images of clouds that get manipulated by temperature, by wind direction and speed, and keep it vibrant so that it's an ever-changing kind of climate bridge. And another piece we're working with data right now is uh, using the aurora borealis as a phenomena of light that is also nature-based and using that kind of, it's aurora, aurora borealis is coming out of geomagnetic activity. So we're using the activity levels of geomagnetism to kind of inform a light pattern. So we are using kind of nature data to inform how light moves. And it seems to be kind of currently a really big inspiration for us as well. Like how do we interpret visualize nature. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions and have a conversation with every one of you. So please don't be shy. If you have questions, please let me know. Yeah. It's going to be in Calgary. Um, it's a public art piece that is permanent and we are actually connecting with the University of Alberta because they are measuring in the physics department the two magnetic activity levels of the region and they are just going to give us a live feed into their measuring. Yep. it as an inspiration and I really like how he describes that color lives between light and dark. So I kind of like, you know, working with light as a predominant medium, it's always about the interplay of light and dark. You don't see light unless you have a certain darkness. So, you know, that's kind of very informative and in how, I mean, for us it's really, like, I also read Albers and his theory of interaction of color, and I always call what we are interested in is the interaction of color and light. So it's really kind of the interplay of what happens with a, a hue of color when it kind of like gets a light source shining another color onto it, and what's the color mixing between those two. That's where I find a less resource of play. And there's a lot to discover. Like I'm really interested in perception in general. Like how do we kind of? I'm interested in anamorphism, for example. Like how do you create shapes and change perspectives? That comes also with looking at architecture. Like how does architecture inform 
like what shapes do they use, how do we manipulate it, how can we shift the conventional perceptive environment. In the installation that you did with the multiple different color lights shining onto people, you would see how the lights split and then show the shadows. Is there a limit to how many lights can actually be projecting to show that? It's always a triangulation, okay. but you can have as many lights within the triangle. Like it's always coming from, you know, it, it has to wash white in the center. Can you give us a little bit of a hint of what you're going to do in our gallery? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've been playing a lot with color, like as I said, color and interaction with light. We're using a cyan magenta yellow as a foundation color. And we use patterns in those three colors. And once you illuminate them, you can really reveal one or the other pattern. So it's like it shifts. So you take one color out through the way you light it, and then you kind of... I mean, it's an effect, actually, that has been used in advertisement. But I'm finding it very exciting as an artist to use that cyan magenta yellow effect with color light, because you actually reveal, you can bring forth and reveal. Petra, I know that a lot of the projects uh, you and Sean have worked on have been in uh, partnerships with cities or large organizations, like you've done work with the City of Chicago Parks Department, obviously the 606 Trail, Architectural Foundations, um, Opera Houses, you're doing the public piece in Calgary. I also know that you, you guys do installations as, um, like for work as well, that are separate from your practice. And I was wondering if you could tell us how that developed. Was it alongside each other, or did you start doing kind of like commercial light installations and that turned into your practice, or you know how that developed? I mean, we have been collaborators for 16 years now, and we met at the School of the Art Institute. Uh, our first kind of experience together as collaborators was we had this idea of an ice block that we wanted to project on. And we illuminated this ice blocks with images of clouds. And we thought, this is so amazing. It looks so good. And it drips, it melts, it creates sound. Uh, so it was this audiovisual experience, because we come out of working with different media. And this ice block got picked up by a producer for an event. And it became a nine ton wall of ice. So for us, being really like fairly new and coming out of school, this was like, whoa, what's happening in this world? Uh, we had no idea we can actually dress a market for what we do. Um, that is not the typical art market. So this kind of like really informs of how we kind of partner up or how we find clients and we see clients as partners. They are co-conspirators. We know where they, sometimes they have an objective that informs what we design. But over time, it becomes really like that somebody actually comes to us and wants our input and what we want to bring forth. And then it becomes a dialogue back and forth. And it is a lot of partnership building on our end. Like, for example, the Farnsworth House project that was in connection with the National Trust of Historic Preservation. And that's a long, long process of like two years just getting access to this house. And it was um, a passion project. That means we actually did our own fundraising. Sometimes people come to us and say, here's a commission opportunity, and it's perfect. But it, it's not always the case. You sometimes just have to run for what you want and work towards it. And the Farnsworth House is just that example where we like we come to the house with a projector, the director loves it, but nobody can fund it. Uh, so, so you have to do, we did a Kickstarter. Uh, we teamed up with a curator who got a national endowment for the arts grant for this project. So there were a lot of layers. Like we also asked NEC for corporate sponsorship uh, who, who with, who was excited to to help us? You know, sometimes you're surprised who wants to help you. 
it's somebody that you meet and who knows someone and then you're like really it's it's working so, so you know like those are beautiful lessons along the way and when you don't know where is it worth it to go that way but you always find out that a lot of people help you so partnership building <laughs> It's a lot about networking, like once you graduate, it's all about like how you connect yourself, where you want your practice to be, and how you make friendships.